We are God's creations, each of us crafted for a purpose. We begin our journey as dreamers in a world filled with possibility. Nothing seems impossible. Although we have faced a global pandemic like no other, God's purpose for our life has not changed. Let's together restore what was diminished and fully live out our purpose. It's time to dream again. Good morning. How are you today? If you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're with us as we bring this uh, series we've been in, Time to Dream Again, to a close. So it's only a three-part series, but we've been talking about this important subject of having a dream, especially if you have a lost dream, to reclaiming that dream. One of the biggest challenges that we have in pursuing and achieving our dream is when we get stuck in the past. You know, things that we've done that we kind of regret or people have done to us, and we find ourselves kind of just, you know, feeling like maybe the dream's gone now, you know, and we kind of get, we stumble there and aren't able to move forward. But, you know, the, one, of, one of the things I love about the Bible is it is so honest about, sometimes about things we don't want to talk about, and something we all share in common when it comes to you know, our past and challenges we have is the Bible says, you know, we all stumble in many ways. It's not just one or two people. It's all of us share that in common. We've dropped the ball. We failed. We've done embarrassing things. We things we regret. We wish we didn't have. I mean, all these kinds of things. And, and here's another way it says it. Not a single person on earth, is, you know, always gets it right. You know, it's so... I mean, all of us have sinned, and it doesn't matter who you are. Every single, it could be the Pope, could be anybody, says not a single person on earth. I've never met somebody who claims to be perfect. They might claim to be close to being perfect, you know. Uh, certainly, they claim to be better than me, and they probably are, you know. They, that's, that's, I'm a low bar, right? You, you know, it's easy to, to, beat, to beat me. But, you know, all of us have mistakes. We've done things we regret, wish we hadn't done says, yes, all have sinned. That means everybody. So that puts us all in that same place together. You know, the the place of of, uh, struggling with our past also and how that can affect our future and, and the dream that God has for us. You see, God has an original dream for you. When he made you, when he created you, it came with a dream, that original dream. And just because we've fallen away and had mistakes and and find ourselves maybe years and years of wasted time, it doesn't mean that God has given up on you or on the original dream that he has for your life. God has a dream. Here's what Jesus said about himself. He said, For the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. And often we find ourselves in that situation where at one point we were all lost and Jesus finds us, but there's other things that get lost other than just our soul. We can get lost when it comes to, you know, our, our hopes. We get lost in our identity and we're confused about that. We don't know, you know, who we are. And God says he came to reclaim and recover that as well. We can lose our peace of mind and our joy. That's a bad situation to be living in this place where you have no peace of mind, where you're always agitated, there's always anxiety, there's always worries, and they just suck the joy out of your life. And you just walk around like dry bones, and there's just, there's no life going on. And Jesus says, I came to restore that. That wasn't God's original plan for you. That's his not ideal for you. And so God wants to restore the confidence in your life and, uh, and, and the hope in your life and the dignity and the vision that he wants you to be living out. How do you get back on track? Well, if we look at God's word, he's, all, you know, something, all, when you look at the biblical heroes, the biblical people in the Bible, all of them have things they've struggled with and they, had to, they, they lost their way and they get back on track. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of great characters in the Bible we can look at uh, that help us 
see that and have a template on how to go forward. Recovering God's original dream for me. Well, the first thing, and we're going to look at Peter right off the bat. First thing is honestly accept responsibility for my poor choices. You see, one of the things that causes us to get stuck, we can't move forward, is because we don't accept our own stuff. It's easy to blame others. It's easy to blame our environment or to blame the government or to excuse it for some reason instead of just owning up to it and saying, hey, nobody held a gun to my head when I made that choice. I chose that. Now, certainly there's influencers. I'm not saying we don't we, we, we negate that. I'm, no, that's true. There are things that influence us. But we own, this is an important part to get off dead center. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve of blaming and excusing and having, instead of just owning it. Now, I said we were going to look at Peter. Peter is one of the 12 disciples. Jesus had 12 disciples. And out of the 12, three of them were particularly close to him, James, John, and Peter. And so we see Peter, when Jesus is right before he's going to be uh, betrayed and crucified during that Easter season, which we'll be celebrating, right? Just two weeks. Two weeks is Easter. Isn't that great? That's pretty cool. We're going to be doing a series. We're starting next week, just a two-week series called New Beginnings, because that's what Easter is all about, is new beginnings. Certainly, you want to be here, invite somebody, come and be part of what we're doing Super excited about that. But th that's what we celebrate is the hope that Easter brings uh, by giving us new beginnings. But Peter needed a new beginning because he ended up in a hole going into Easter. He, and, and we see this story there about Peter, first of all, is at the Last Supper. So Jesus gathers, gathers together with his 12 disciples for the Last Supper. This is going into uh, right before he's betrayed, before he's you know, crucified, all that stuff. And he gathers together with them, and, he's, and he has this honest moment with them. He says, hey, listen, there's, you know, that you guys are going to scatter. And, and then he starts telling Peter, he goes, Peter, you know, we, he, he's not, he doesn't single him out, but he, in his mind he knows who it is. But he goes, hey, somebody's going to betray me. And, and we see Peter's response. In fact, Peter's behavior really gives us the reasons why we make poor decisions. He, that, in, that, in the Last Supper, and then subsequently, we see Peter do four things. First of all, at the Last Supper, we see him just, you know, he's, not, he's got pride. He's got, you know, ego and arrogance. That kind of stuff will always get us in trouble. And Peter is no exception. When Jesus says, somebody here is going to betray me, Peter's response is, oh, you know, yeah, I know there's a bunch of losers in here. He goes, but I'm not one of them. He says, everyone else may stumble in their faith, but I will not. He goes, I'm above that. I'm above that. I would never do that. So, I, I, you, know, I, you know, I don't know how these guys ended up at the show, but you chose wisely when you chose me, Jesus. You know, this kind of thing. Now, the truth is, all of us can make bad choices if the circumstances were in the right place. There, you know, all of us can make poor choices. You know, so we have to be careful because it's pride that causes us to think, oh, I'm above that. I would never do that. Well, if you know the story, Peter does do it. And he's calling him out in advance. He says, beware if you think you could never, it could never happen to you, lest your, what? Your pride becomes your downfall. It's when we start to think we're above that. I've been a Christian for 40 years for over 30 years, I've been in, in ministry, full-time ministry. I've known many, many pastors that have fallen, sadly. But not once did I think, oh, that would never happen to me. I would never do that. I'd never do that to Sharon. I'd never do that to my boys. I'd never do that to the church. No, when I, when I hear about somebody, particularly if I knew them, I think, that could be me if I'm not careful. I better be careful. I better make sure I have the boundaries in place in my life. I better make sure I have the precautions. And so we have. We've set up so, lots and lots of precautions because I don't want to be, and I know I could. I don't want to be one of those guys that, you know, has to stand in front of their congregation and, you know, and, and, and admit a bunch of crazy stuff or their, or their, to their wife or their, their kids. You know, I'm not better than them. I'm saying, telling you up front. It's because I know I could. So it keeps me humble, like, oh, no, you know, I, I, that could be me. I better be careful. That, 
you make better choices when you have humility. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Now, humility is not free, but once you get humility, hey, you get some free wisdom out of the deal. <laughs> humility helps us make good choices. Also, fatigue can cause problems. When you're tired, when you're, fi- you know, all of us, when we get tired, we start to make poor decisions. In fact, how many times have you looked back and you go, well, that was because I was fatigued. You know, I was, I was tired. I wasn't, even, maybe you weren't even aware of it. Some, lately, I've been traveling to see my mom as, uh, you know, as, as she has greater needs. Uh, and I've been going actually once a month. And when I come back, Sharon, Sharon will tell me, she goes, you know, you're fatigued. I'm not even aware of it. You know, and then I'll say, oh, okay, well, I'll try to be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Here, not the, Vince Lombardi said, you know, it's fatigue that makes cowards of us all. We, we do things we wouldn't do. We're not as brave. We're not as smart. We make poor decisions. Now, after the Last Supper, Jesus takes the 11 disciples, because Judas beelines it to go betray him with the Pharisees. But he goes back, and, uh, and, and now so Jesus goes to his prayer place, the Garden of Gethsemane, and, he takes his, and then he takes James and John and Peter, his close associates, with him. And he says, hey, I need you guys to just, you know, just stand here with me. And he doesn't even ask him to pray at first. He just says, would you just be here and, you know, watch and stay awake? You know, the ministry of presence. There's just, there's, you know, there's power just in being with somebody. You don't always have to have something to say. But Jesus comes back after an hour. They're asleep. They're fatigued, right? Could you not stay awake, he says to them, for even an hour? See, we'll make poor choices when we are fatigued. You should never make an important decision when you're in fatigue. Fatigue will wear you down. Then you have the fear of disapproval. The fear of disapproval. When we're afraid about what other people will think about us. What will, what will they say at work if I speak up for you know, godly morals? And say my mind. I know what the Bible says, but uh, what if I say something? What will people think of me? What you know? What will my boss think if if you know what you know if I you know if I stand up for what Jesus thinks or or, or at school? You know what will my professors or other students think? Now Peter, he was worried about what people were thinking about him at the Garden of Gethsemane. The Judas comes and he betrays Jesus, brings some guards with him. They arrest him. And they're hauling them away. All the disciples, they scatter except for Peter. Peter still is following Jesus, but notice what it says. He's following at a distance. At a distance. Some of you are believers, but you're following God at a distance. You know, he's at a distance in, in your life. You're not really close to him. You're, and, and I just need to tell you straight up, when you follow God at a distance, you'll make poor choices. That's part of the reason we make, that's what we're talking about right now. And there's more than just four. We're going to look at four. But part of the reason we make poor choices is when we keep God at a distance. We keep him far off. And then lastly, short-term pleasure. Short-term pleasure. In other words, I'm going to live for today. And the principle is, if I live for pleasure today, I'll experience pain tomorrow, pain later. If, if I live for, if I, if I go through pain today, I will get rewarded with pleasure later. I mean, it's true in finances, right? You can, you can, you can, you know, save up and endure the pain now, and then you, you know, have the pleasure of, you know, buying something later. Or you can, hey, I'm not waiting. I'm going to get a loan. I don't care what the interest rate is. And you, you know, have, you know, put everything on your credit card. How many of you know when you have a big credit card bill, you had pleasure today and pain, pain later. Every month that comes in. Was that really worth it? I mean, it was pleasurable, but was it worth all the pain I'm enduring today? And that's true in life. When, when, when we make choices to cater to the easy route, the pleasurable route, the, the convenient way. Peter did this. So he's following Jesus at a distance. Jesus starts getting this mock trial going on. He can still see him. He, Peter can watch what's going on, but he's getting cold. It's cold at night. So he decides to 
go and he warms himself at the fire. The guards are there. These are the guys that are going to that are going to beat Jesus. He, once they hand Jesus over, they're going to blindfold him and, and, and cold cock him and punch him and rip his beard out, scourge him, eventually crucify him. That's the, and, and Peter's hanging out with those guys, warming himself. Hey, you got some s'mores here? You know, pass me a hot dog. You know, I mean, this, th- every time we choose convenience over character, we will make poor choices. We'll make bad decisions. And so, it, those things can cause us to uh, stumble in following God's dream that he has for us. And so we want to eliminate those. Now, it's interesting, Jesus was not surprised about any of this. In fact, he predicted it at the Last Supper. He says, hey, this is what's going to go down. Jesus says, Simon Peter, Satan has demanded the right to test each one of you. So he's kind of pointing out Simon, but he's talking about them all. And he's saying, hey, none of this is coming at a surprise. I already know what's going on. In fact, you're going to be tested and you're going to fail. You're not going to do well. You know, we don't always pass every test that Satan throws our way, right? Which is we call temptation. The things that cause us, hey, should I do God's will or do something that pleases me, something that's comfortable, some, you know, something that falls into those four that we just looked at. You know, pride, fatigue, fear of people, short-term gain, short-term pleasure. He says, you're going to be tested, but he goes, but I've been praying for you. Listen, I, I love it when somebody's praying for me. Sometimes when I'm going through a real difficult time, I will come forward for prayer if I'm not speaking. You know, I'll find somebody to pray for me. There's something powerful that happens when we get in, together and pray. That's one of the great things about a small group. People know you by name, know what you're going through, can pray for you. That doesn't happen on the weekend services. It doesn't happen on the online church. It happens in a small group. That's the power of a small group, people praying for you. But, hey, listen, no matter who's praying for you, the best news of all is it says Jesus is praying for you. So he, 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 you didn't, whatever you did didn't catch him off guard. He's praying for you. And then he says, he says that your faith will be strong. And then he goes, and, and you, you'll make it. You're going to make it through this. He goes, and when you have come back to me, know that you'll make it through the other side. You just keep following the Lord. Let God work in your life. And then he goes after that, come help, help other people. That's always what God wants us to do. We don't go through difficulties just for the sake of difficulties. In fact, that's one of the things that distinguishes us from people in the world. And the people in the world, they just go through difficulties and then that's it. They can't wait to get behind them. For Christ followers, God wants us to use that to encourage other people, to help other people. And it does help others when we do that. It does encourage others. If I get up and I share with you all of my strengths, all of the things I've accomplished, you know, you probably go, oh, that's cool for you, Andy. That's great. You know, it sounds like you've done a lot. That's, you know, but I wouldn't encourage you. You know, it might, I might impress you. Probably not, but I might. But if I tell you about the struggles I've gone through and the weaknesses and when I've stumbled, that encourages you. And then how God saw me through it, you're going to go, well, if he can get through it, then I certainly can. That's how we encourage. And he goes, that's, that's what I want from you. So we honestly accept responsibility for our poor choices. Then we looked at ways that we ca- cause us to make poor choices so that we can avoid those. Number two, humbly ask God's mercy and forgiveness. God wants to pour his forgiveness and his mercy into your life. He just wants to overwhelm you with his love. But we've got to be willing to seek that and say, God, I want that. There's some humility that goes into that. It's really built upon first owning it, saying, hey, I've made some bad decisions, which is why I need forgiveness and God's mercy. And then we go to God and we say, I I need it. Another example, I told you there's a number of them in the Bible. We just looked at Peter. You know, with David, King David, he made a lot of mistakes, if you've read through his life. That's recorded in the Old Testament and in Chronicles and in Samuel. And and one, his lowest point was, was when he had committed adultery and then murdered her husband to cover it up. So all in one whack, murder and adultery. Guy knew, a guy who was faithful to him, friend of his, murdered him, took his wife. Bad deal. 
he, gets, he comes to the place where he realizes, man, I screwed up huge. I screwed up big time. And, uh, and then he writes this psalm, Psalm 51. And so if you're in a place where you know God's calling you to, uh, you know, resolve some stuff that you've done in the past, you, you need to clean your plate. You need to get rid of that stuff. You need to have a clear conscience. You need to ask for God's forgiveness. Psalm 51 is an incredible psalm. Here's a little bit of that right here. It says, David says, and, and he really lists eight things in his prayer request. He says, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithfulness, according to the greatness of your compassion. And then he says, wipe out my wrongdoing. That's only, only God can do that. He goes, wipe out my wrongdoing. Wash me thoroughly from my guilt that came from my wrongdoing and cleanse me from my sin. He goes on, he says, for I know my wrongdoings and my sin is constantly before me. Create in me a clean heart. And so God doesn't want us just to wallow in our sin and our guilt. He, no, he, he's, he's, he's a creative God and, he, and, he, and he's going to, change what's going on inside us. So create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. God has that for you. He's wanting you to have a steadfast spirit starting to pursue your dream that he's got for you again. Do not cast away from your, your presence from me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. The, God says, I want you to live with a, with a, a joy in your life that comes, only comes from the Holy Spirit and what he gives you and sustain me with a willing spirit. So th those are the eight things that he prays. Now notice the thing that he's going to do. So he says, you do, God, you do these eight things in my life. Here's what I will do. He goes, then I will teach wrongdoers your ways. In other words, I'm going to use my painful experience to help other people, to encourage other people, to help them turn to you. It's the same thing that Jesus told Peter to do. Remember, he said that then go and help other people when you've gone through a difficult time. And so this is, God says, I never want to waste a pain in your life. Never waste a hurt. Never waste a wound. We do it by burying it. But God says, no, I want you to use that. Here's some truths about God's dream for your life. First of all, there is no plan B. So often we think we're working on plan B because we've messed up so much or we're too old or whatever our reason is, you know, we, you know, God can't unscramble eggs. Oh yeah, he can, he can do whatever he wants. He created the universe. I mean, he, he can, he can do whatever he wants. And so don't, don't say, no, I'm working on some other plan than plan A. God has an original plan for you and he's still working on that. That's your plan. You were born with that plan. Your gifts are tied to that plan. That's why we do growth track. You hear about growth track here all the time because we believe in that. Why? Because we want you to work off of God's dream and his plan that he has for your life. And, and so we want to partner with you to get on track with that. Discover your gifts. Get moving. Move towards the dream that God has for you. That's what growth track's all about. Today, we do step three right after this service. We'll feed you. We watch your kids. Try to do whatever we can to make sure that you you know, you can make it. It's only an hour long, but we ask you, just give us four weekends, one hour each, four weekends. Step one, two, three, four, and help us to help you get on your plan A. Then my mistakes are part of God's plan. So often we think that that's kind of like God has to work despite our mistakes, despite the hardships we've gone through. No, actually, that's part of God's plan for you. He will integrate the mistakes and, and the things we do wrong. Because there's a lot of problems in the world. There's a lot of evil in the world. And so if, we're, if, if, that's, if God's plan is contingent on no hardship, no evil impacting us, it would never happen for anybody. No, he integrates that in. Look at what the Bible says here. It says, so we are convinced that every single detail, every detail of our lives is continually woven together. For what? Well, he's integrating every single detail of our life, we, weaving it together for what? For good. And not that everything is good, he, because God is good, because he can unscramble eggs. He does that for good, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed dream, the original dream, the purpose that he's given you. 
And so no matter what happens in your life, he'll integrate that in. You know, you just say, well, you know, oops, I shouldn't have put that in. He's like the grand chef, right? You accidentally throw jalapenos in. And you're thinking, oh, I ruined the whole dish. No, 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 look, I can do this. And he starts throwing in some other sauces. All of a sudden, you go, wow, you made that taste great. God, God's able to do that. And then third, God expects me to use my mistakes to help others. That's part of the plan. You'll never fulfill your original plan if you think it's all about you and you bury your pain, you bury your, the things you're going through. Who better to help an alcoholic than somebody who's gone through that? Who's better to help somebody who's gone through financial you know, distress or bankruptcy or, or massive indebtedness and, than somebody who's gone through that? Who's better to help somebody who's experienced the pain of, of uh, infertility or miscarriages than somebody who's gone through that. You see, part of God's dream for you includes you using your pain redemptively. In other words, letting, letting God use that to heal others, to encourage others, to strengthen others, just like he told Peter, just like David promised he would. That's part of God's plan for you is to recognize No, God's original plan has never been forfeited for me. Also, mistakes, problems, things that happen to me, that's all part of God's plan, his original plan for me. He's still going to accomplish that. Not that God did it for you, but none of it caught him off guard, just like with Peter. He goes, I know what's coming your way, and I know how you'll respond, but that's God's still going to use that in your life for you and for others. It says, if troubles weigh us down, and that's some of you, right? I got some troubles. Troubles weigh you down. That just means what? That we receive even more comfort to pass along. You know, I mean, that's part of the way we interpret as Christ followers is when difficult things come. If you've been a Christ, if you've been a Christian for a while, you maybe you've heard that. Well, God's gonna use that in your life. That'll be part of your testimony. Well, that's true, hopefully. I mean, it's only part of your testimony if you, if you testify. If you say, this is what God's doing in my life. This is what God did. This is what I went through. And this is how I got out the other end. To pass on for your deliverance. And then number three, gratefully accept God's amazing grace. So we own up to what our own stuff is. Hey, I've, I've made poor choices. No more blaming. No more accusing. You know, more, no more looking around. I've made poor choices. Seeking God humbly for his mercy, his forgiveness. And then when God gives it, to accept it. God, I receive your amazing grace. It's called grace because it's not based on works. The Bible says that there's nothing we can do, no amount of works. And that's often what we try to do. And some religions are built around pain, penance, or, you know, earning, you know, if you're good enough on this moral scale, then maybe you know, you'll get God's forgiveness. No, God says it's because of what Christ did, because of what Jesus did on the cross, that's transferred all of that to us, and we don't do anything. Because it's not about us doing something, it's what Jesus did, and that's why it's called grace. So since we are now joined to Christ, we have been given the treasures of redemption. This is that word I've been using about redemptive, you know, pain, letting God use it. Just like the pain that Jesus went through on the cross, that was redemptive. How? It brought grace to us. There was something good that came out of the pain Jesus went through by his blood, the total cancellation of our sins, all because of the cascading riches of his grace. God says he wants to give you his his grace, and it just cascades, you know, constantly over your life as you receive it. If you're in a small group this semester here at Vineyard, we're, most of our groups, nearly all of them, are in freedom groups. We're doing a church-wide freedom, uh, freedom group, and, and most of you are in small groups. We look at the numbers, we know. And you know that this past week was week seven, and we talked about forgiveness, the power of forgiveness. Some incredible prayer moments happened in, in our group, and I know in a number of your groups, because Forgiveness unlocks some powerful things. But one of the things that so many of us have to experience in forgiveness, and our curriculum talked about that, was 
forgiving yourself. Because we can be our worst critics. We're just the self-talk, the negative self-talk, the berating of ourselves, the, con- the condemning of ourselves, blaming ourselves. I mean, we can get caught up in this, this, this internal dialogue that just constantly sabotages ourselves as well as our relationships. We're unduly hard on people. We're judgmental. And where does that come from? There's a source to that. It's, that's how we're treating ourselves. That's how we're treating ourselves. But the Bible says in Christ, it can be different. He says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. You can stop condemning yourself. You can stop making yourself feel bad. Nailing yourself to a cross. You see, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Every time we, have, we don't forgive ourselves, that's really, that's our way of saying what Jesus did on the cross was not enough. That's why it's sin, actually. What Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough because the truth is, it was enough. And so you don't have to continue to condemn yourself. So why does my sin not invalidate God's original dream for my life? Well, three things. Number one, Jesus already paid for all my sins. My past sins, the things I did wrong, the things I'm currently, if you're currently doing stuff, the few, anything you do in the future, none of it catches God off guard. He's, he, he's not surprised by any of it. And he died for all of it. He died for all of it. It says, when Jesus served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good, not only ours, but everybody's. Everybody who seeks him, goes to him, receives Christ into their life, he goes, that's, what, that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. You don't have to pay for your sin again. You know, in our ju- judicial system, if you have to pay twice for the same crime, that's called double jeopardy, and that's not allowed because you've already paid for it once. And that's true in God's kingdom. Listen, Jesus paid for all of your sin, so you don't have to pay for it anymore. Number two, God's goodness isn't based on my performance. I'm thankful for that because my performance doesn't even come close to meeting his standards. But God's goodness, that's, again, God's grace. His goodness comes to me not based on how good I am and how hard I work and what I do to try to achieve His, his, his good pleasure and his, his best for my life. No, it's not based on my performance, thank the Lord, because I am going to screw up. I'm going to make messes. And, and listen, we all make messes. Sometimes we're, we compare ourselves, right? Well, I'm better than so-and-so, but I, I'm not as good as that person. So I guess... I don't know where you'd end up with that anyways, right? That's, that's kind of a, you know, but we do that. But it really makes no sense to do that because that's why the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of God's glorious ideal. All of us are found in that spot. So don't, it doesn't mean anything to look around and compare yourselves. You've messed up. That's all you need to know. You own it. You go to God for forgiveness, and then you receive his grace. And he will give it to you. He saved us because of his mercy. It was not because of the good deeds that we did. Amen to that. Lastly, God's calling and gifts are given unconditionally. God gives his gifts to us unconditionally. And he doesn't take them back. They're gifts. It's not because you earned it. It's, that's the whole meaning of a gift is that you didn't earn it, right? If you were to come and work for me for a couple weeks here at the church, and I gave you some tasks to do, and you worked for two weeks, and it was payday, and then I gave you a check, and I said, here, here's your gift. You go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Andy, that's not how this thing works. Uh, didn't I show up on time? Didn't I work hard? You know, and, and, and didn't we agree to a pay, and I'm getting my pay now? You go, that's not a gift, my friend. I, I don't know, I don't know what you've been telling people, but you better change your lingo, because that is my due reward. I earned that. And that would be true. And God gives us gifts because nothing we could do can earn what he gives us. And so they're gifts just because he loves us. And so, and again, if you start looking around to your right and to your left, you'll see people that get gifts and you might think, what in the world? What is God thinking? That person's all messed up because it's a gift. It's not based on your performance. That's the good news, that you can come and receive God's incredible gifts and his calling. 
his purpose, his dream for your life. For the gifts and God's dream or his calling are irrevocable. And nothing's going to change that. It's irrevocable. It doesn't matter what you did. He's not going to change his dream for you. you. You are working on his original dream. And he can make it happen. doesn't matter how old you are, what you've done, where you've been. God has a plan A for you. Now, the things that often get us stuck where we're at, can't seem to move forward. It's almost like, you know, you're trying to download a movie. You're all ready. And then the movie just buffers, right? You got that little circle just, you're thinking, you know, you're trying to stay calm. Like, this is super irritating. You know, is it the, on their end? Or is it the, my internet? Too many people use it. Am I getting gypped on my bandwidth? I mean, you, right? You start going all, but all you see is this. And that happens in life because of our past. Sometimes we have such significant loss that we just get lost in grief. And grief can be one of those circles. We're just in so much pain. I mean, when we, when we have massive loss, we, we can get stuck in, in just in grieving. Sometimes when we sin, it might be intentionally, it might be unintentionally, but sin is sin, and it keeps us from, you know, kind of keeps us off the path. And so sin causes guilt. We're all familiar with that because we've all sinned. All of us. We talked about that right out of the get-go here today. And so we all know the feelings of guilt and shame that's associated with that. That can cause guilt. It just keeps you spinning. Not moving towards the dream God has for you. And then when people hurt us, they lash out, they reject us, they betray us. That causes grudges. And we get stuck. They, somehow it latches itself to us when we get a grudge and saps our emotional energy, our physical energy, robs our sleep, our peace of mind, our joy. Or just, it just wrecks us. Those are the things that keep us from moving forward in God's dream that he has. And some of you, when I name those, you, you know that's where you're at. You know that you're, you've got loss and the grieving that's still there. No matter how long it's been, it could have been years ago, but you're still grieving. I'm not saying grieving's wrong. I'm saying that can keep you from moving forward in the dream that God has for you. Or maybe from sin and you're experiencing guilt, the shame that's associated with that. Maybe somebody really hurt you, just betrayed you, turned on you, and you're you know, you just can't let that go. You've got grudges. What do you do for those things? If that's you, and I know a number of you, that's, that is your place where you're at. And God wants you to deal with that. What do you do? Well, when you have loss like that and you're grieving, you need God's healing. You need healing. And God can heal. Jesus went around. The, the, the ministry he did more than any other. He taught at the Sermon on the Mount. All kinds, More than any other was he brought healing. Sometimes there's physical healing, sometimes there's emotional, mental healing, all kinds of healing, spiritual healing. You need healing. If you've sinned and you're struggling with guilt, you need confession. Just confess it, like Psalm 51, right? David got to the point where he said, you know, I, I can't just live with this anymore. This will rob me of the life God's given me, the dream. Confession got grudges and because of people hurting you so so deeply forgiveness forgiveness let them go it's not it's not you know, it'll never be right until someday god says he promises he'll mete out justice but it's if you all if you're waiting for the fairness or all these kinds of things that we looked at in our small group this past week it'll never happen or certainly unlikely and so you forgive so that you can move on. Not for them. You forgive so that you can move on. Healing. Confession. Forgiveness. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you're joining online, I invite you to join us.
because this is real stuff. This is God's doing something in your life. got a promise. You were born with a promise attached to it. And he's not giving up on that. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to invite you to pray along with me. If that's you, you're saying, Andy, I need to. One of those things hit me. I need healing. I need, con- I need to confess something to God. Just kind of get it off my my chest, out of my heart, out of my life. I need to let something go. I need to let somebody go. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to pray with me, but I want you to let me know that's you, so I can be praying specifically for you. So right, right now, I'm just going to ask you with every eye closed, just giving everybody space. It's not about joining Vineyard Church or anything. I'm, gonna re- I'm not going to ask you to stand up or embarrass you in any way like that. Just right where you're at, would you say, Andy, that's me. That's me. Just by raising your hand right where you're at, just saying, that's me. Put your hand up. Say, I need prayer for that. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. I see, yep. In the back. I see people on the side. Anybody else? Just say, that's me. Okay. Put your hand down. Pray with me. Say, God, today, I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. say, God, heal me of that, that, those losses that I can't seem to get free from. Pour your healing sob into my heart, into my life. You say, God, I want to release. The, you know, there's moments of grace. You can't do it in your own, in your own strength, and you already know that. But there's moments when we kind of touch you know, the hem of Jesus' garment, so to speak. We, You know, there's kind of an open heaven. There's a sense of God's grace. And for some of you, you're right there. You can sense it. There's a grace that wasn't there before. And that's God's gift to you. That's not just some happenstance. God's doing something in your life. And seize the moment right now by forgiving in this moment. Just say, God, today, right now, through your grace, I want to. I'm, I'm choosing to forgive what so-and-so did to me. Just name them. say, God, create in me a clean heart. Put a steadfast spirit inside me and restore the joy of my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, I'm so proud of you. I know some, you know, that's, those are big steps when we're wrestling with some big stuff like that. And it's, your life is in the balance. I mean, it really is your God's dream. So it's worth it. It's worth it. And to continue on and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what God has for me. Well, listen, if you prayed with me, let me know about that. There's ways that you can communicate to us if you're online. They're popping up now. Here in this in-person service, we gave, that's why we give you a, a program. Uh, there's a connect card in there. You can write any prayer request that you have. We will be happy and diligent to pray for you. Uh, if you prayed to receive Christ, let me know about that. Uh, each week, people make decisions for Jesus. Uh, put that on the Connect card. Say, Andy, I prayed with you. You can put it on the boxes that are mounted on the wall as you exit. You know, as you're leaving, you'll see on the right-hand side, Growth Track. That starts right after the service. Hope to see you in there as you can start to, you know, move forward. We want to partner with you in your journey in discovering God's best for your life. Okay, here's some ways that that you can contribute. If you want to financially help what we're doing here at Vineyard as we share the good news of Jesus Christ with our community and really to the world. And uh, we love to give because it's just a joyful way we can partner with God and what he's doing in this in, in, in the world. And so some ways, vineyardchurch.com, where you can text four, uh, 45777, group code VCC, and then the amount. Well, would you stand with me? We're going to sing one final song and just kind of let God one more time hear our voice as we sing out to him. Would you do that? Father, thank you, Lord, 
that we get to follow an awesome dream you've customized for each one of us. Lord, we want to sing to you, express our love and our devotion. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.